Yakchut's perspective. 2678, Terran calendar, 35 years before. I sit in the chair on the bridge of this naval escort vessel, scowling at my comms officer. That's not funny, Carmagon, I state irritably. I'm not joking, sir. We've been hailed over EM frequencies quite insistently by multiple ships, converging on our current location. The language they're heading us in is an undocumented one. Also, it seems that one of this planet's moons is a cacophony of EM signals, suggesting quite extensive habitation. Mostly in another undocumented language, different from the ones they're heading us in. This is a death world system, Calm. You expect me to believe we just stumbled upon a space flight, capable, uncontacted species, on a random freight escort mission, in a death world system? You can believe what you like, sir, but that's certainly how it's looking at the moment. I sigh. If this turns out to be some kind of practical joke, Calm, I swear. If it is so, is one being played on both of us? I grip my teeth and ask, can we decode their language? Carmagon thumps his left fist in the Gation. Not the one they're hailing us in, sir, no, but... He raises that arm in affirmation. There's certainly enough of the other language coming from that moon to decode it algorithmically. That will have to do. Let us hope that they don't view being addressed in that language as an insult. Put it on screen. A moment passes before, in front of me, appears a representation of an unfamiliar being. Its face is bilaterally symmetrical, and its skin is medium brown. Two rounded ears protrude slightly from the size of his head. His two forward-facing eyes are white, with dark brown circular pupils, and between them is a mouldy, protuberant sense organ, vertically oriented on his flat face, nares pointing downward. It has a headdress of long, curly, jet-black fur, integument that seems to grow naturally from its scalp, with two shorter, smaller lines of the same growing above its eyes, tilted down in the middle, and heavy creases between them. It has a horizontally oriented mouth, its star-white teeth bared in obvious anger. Below its mouth is a chin with a curious, forward-jutting spur at its point. Its head sits on a neck, a little less than half the height, over-wide, flat shoulders with the top of some kind of chest protrusion, visible at the bottom of the frame. This is Master Chief, Gabriella Baobab, Soloniana, over Zachary System Defense Force. Would you jokers keep to explain what exactly you think you are doing here? Says the undocumented creature angrily, in an incomprehensible language. Apologies, sir or madam, our computers have not been able to decipher the language you are using to address me. Are you able to converse in the language you should be hearing right now? A range of indecipherable emotions play across the being's face as it listens to the translation of my words. Then it rolls its eyes and purses its lips. The Malang says a nice touch. Aliens don't know English and had to decipher the most common language in the signals from Lemak instead, right? I raise my hand in confirmation and say, That is correct, sir or madam. Ow! Oh, and aliens wouldn't be able to tell that I was a woman either, right? That is also correct, madam, I say, keeping my hand in the air. Rolling her head, she asks, All right, Mr. Alien, you got a name? Who are you working for, exactly? My name is Captain Yakchot. I work for the Galactic Union Navy and I'm currently providing an anti-piracy escort to freight between the planets Prosperity and Uxaxo. Yaha! Just keep digging, buddy. I'm sorry, what do you mean? What do I mean? What do I mean? Shrieks the woman from the uncontented species. What I mean is your convoy came here into my system, unscheduled and unannounced. You aren't broadcasting any kind of registration. 
You didn't check in with Aerospace Control on the McVal Val before jumping the queue to Degors into Adriana Rinrira. When hailed, you gave me a moxinim and tell me you were escorting freight as an illegal mercenary for an unregistered defence contractor, all the while wearing that stupid digital mask and pretending to be first contact for beyond the fucking stars. So, just keep digging because right now I'm going to be escorting every single one of you off of that ship in handcuffs. What are you even supposed to be? If that's meant to be a Krogan, it's way off. You're asking my species, madam. My rank is untranslatable rank, Master Chief, meaning proficient leader. And my name is Gabriella Baobab Solaniana, Captain. Pick one to address me by. And yes, tell me your species, says the angry alien woman, in what I'm 90% sure is a mocking tone, despite the translation not yet being that sophisticated. My people are called the Ulat. Every word I have spoken to you has been the truth, Master Chief. We didn't check in with your authorities because our charts show this system has been uninhabited and unsettleable. Bullshit they do, she interrupts. That trait might work in planets settled recently, but Lem McValvau has been settled since untranslatable date, 2375. There's no way your charts could be that out of date. Unless... My chart of this system was last updated 70,000 years ago, I pose. Oh, you mean 69,500 years before interstellar flight? You mean 69,000 years before the Industrial Revolution? You mean 60,000 years before humanity first set hoe to soil? She raises a pentadactyl hand, slimmer and more nimble looking than mine, and holds it out in... Some kind of accentuating gesture. Master Chief, how good is your digital analysis software? The woman looks extremely confused as she asks. Best there is, just about. Why? I invite you to use it on this call. If you think my appearance is the result of me wearing a digital mask, then surely with the best analysis there is... Traces of the manipulation would be detectable, wouldn't they? The mistrustful woman narrows her eyes, her mouth seeming to decrease its width by half, as she says, Mahaka, run analysis on this feed. Search for any kind of tampering. No irregularities detected, Master Chief Soloniana. Additionally, preliminary scans of the intruding ships have revealed several anomalies that will be difficult to explain as either illegal smugglers or practical jokers. Projecting a greater than 99% likelihood that they are perpetrating no deception. Answers one of the woman's underlings, instantly, and with a strangely artificial voice. Her mouth falls open slightly, and she turns to stare at me, wide-eyed, seeming to now realise the monumentality of this moment for her species. After six seconds, she speaks decisively. This is above my pay grade. Power down and come to. Make no attempt to leave the system while we... Figure out what to do about you. We're not going anywhere, Master Chief. Two days later. The first attempt of the diplomat pair to board my ship was 35 minutes ago. They came for the airlock in sealed, pressurised suits, which they explained ahead of time were to prevent any xenonautic disease transmission. What they did not see fit to warn us of was the noxious cloud of isopropyl vapour that emanated from the outsides of their suits, causing any who approached to gag and retch as the alcohol in the air burned our eyes and lungs. They apologised profusely, and assured us that this had not been an intentional chemical attack, and instead was just another line of defence against the transmission of disease. Dowsing the outside of the suits in a 70-30 mixture of isopropyl alcohol and water was meant to sterilise them of pathogens. They hadn't realised we would be so sensitive to the residual fumes. Their species is either very biochemically resistant to alcohol, 
or quite stupid not to realise such a thing. That section of the ship has been sealed off, and the air cycled. For their part, the humans adjusted their absurdly cautious disease countermeasures by adding a shower and sterile distilled water after the alcohol shower. Have they recently experienced some kind of epidemic? Why else be so cautious? Instances of xenonosis are vanishingly rare, though they likely don't know that given their uncontacted status. Perhaps their fiction emphasises it as a threat. The airlock cracks and through steps a male with purple eyes, who stands around one of his heads, half of mine shorter than me. His name is Nadum Lima Rain. It has been explained that as a Teshuan, he is unusually tall for the human species. Beside him is his wife, Narina Orchid Rain, standing a little more than my waist height. Their faces are fully visible through the clear polymer of their helmet's faceplates. They avoid greeting any of us, meeting them with the bared teeth that we explained would trigger feelings of discomfort in us, for resembling a threat display, and instead turn up the size of their closed mouths while holding both their palms in front of them in an oolat greeting gesture. I stride toward them, trying hard not to dwell on the possibilities of what they might be. Extending a tetradactyl right hand to them, in their people's gesture of friendly greeting, I begin. Ambassador's reign, it is a pleasure and a delight to... Ugh! I trip over the same clumsy feet that excluded me from the army a lifetime ago, and fall forward. I am going to kill them. They can't even be a tenth of my mass. Having me land on top of them is going to kill them and go down in history as the single most bungled first contact ever made. My body impacts the larger ones and finds it... solid. I barely have time to be surprised about just how sturdy the bean I've impacted is, before I hit the smaller and find her, impossibly, even more solid. They are neither killed nor crippled by the clumsy fall of one so much larger than they. They aren't even knocked off their feet, though they are required to brace themselves to remain standing. Four hands extend to my chest and push me back into an upright position. I take four steps back and drop to one knee, placing both hands on the floor and saying, May I die 512 deaths for this transgression? Are you hurt? Trying to ignore the bruises blooming on my shoulders, where my body impacted theirs, and chest where their hands impacted me. I'm fine, Nadum, says the female human. No harm done. I was surprised by just how light you were, Captain Yakchut. What about you? Are you okay? Without raising my head, I answer, my well-being is immaterial after such a blunder, ambassadors. It's really fine, Captain. We'll call it even after us accidentally tear-gassing you, the first time we came aboard, giggles the woman. Now, how about you stand up and we find somewhere to talk? Later. I sit across the table from the pair in the ship's conference room. Each of them occupy one of the ulat sized chairs, looking slightly reminiscent of hatchlings given how much smaller the adults of their species are than mine. So, Captain... The Planetary Assembly of Limak Valval has authorized us to give you this. The man places an object on the table and slides it to me. It's a data drive containing all the information on our people that we're able to give you at the moment. Smiles the woman through closed lips. It has an expansive collection of films, books, music, codices, and a few of our most spoken languages and encyclopedias worth of non-fiction information about our ecology, history, culture, etc. All of it is very prominently tagged with fiction and non-fiction. Would hate anyone to get scared into thinking we're going to unleash metahumans or werewolves or dragon riders or zombie hordes on them. It does not, I'm afraid, contain any information on our military technology or capabilities nor location data for any of the other Terran worlds, 
at the insistence of the local military and intelligence services. They even had the AI in charge of the scrubbing black out any shots of the clear night sky in any of the photos and films from other planets, in case you managed to use the stars to locate those systems. We told them they were being ridiculous, but they absolutely would not budge. I hope you don't view our people's caution too unfavorably. I thump my fist on the table, startling them with the negation, and say, of course not. As a military man myself, I understand completely. But, I'm sorry, did you say an AI coordinated this list? You have servile AI? Forgetting to keep their teeth hidden, both ambassadors burst out laughing. Servile, cackles the woman, raising her hand to cover her mouth seeming incapable of pulling her lips down to hide them. We absolutely do not have servile AI. We have AI citizens. I frown, a pit of anxiety in my stomachs as I ask, but how did you avoid the derangement? Simply by not treating them as servals is how, smiles the man. When given the same liberties as any organic citizen, the same opportunities for social connection and professional fulfillment, we managed to mostly circumvent the uprisings and breakdowns that plagued early research. That's an extremely worrying thing to learn. Ambassadors, I have to tell you something. Something it may be distressing for you to hear, I start. The pair's expressions change and they lean forward. The planet you call home, by galactic standards, is extremely dangerous. Yes, says the man, the medium brown skin of his flat nose and brow creasing. Master Chief Saloni Yaina told us you described this system as unsettleable. I am curious to know why. We celebrated our tricentennial a few years ago. I tend to think there was such a dire threat that we had missed for so long. Is there a gamma ray burst on his way here? A nearby star about to go supernova? A black hole we somehow haven't detected? I give another thump, which they do not start at this time, and say, None of those things. It's the planet itself, and the system it's in which are the threats. The star you call Zanahari is volatile and high energy. The crust of your planet is thin, and prone to powerful upheavals and emissions of molten rock. The gravity is more than 9ms2, and the ecosystem is structured with dangerous herbivores being killed and eaten by vicious carnivores. The pair both raise a single eyebrow and look at each other, with confusion. I don't need a translator to perceive. Um, is that not just almost any life-bearing planet you're describing there, Captain? Asks the woman. I thump my fist. It is not, no. When we discovered you here, I assumed that this system had to have been misclassified in its last survey, so I checked some of the data. May I have your permission to show you some highly disturbing footage of an animal that existed on your world 70,000 years ago? The two lean forward and wag their heads up and down, which it takes me a moment to remember is an affirmative. I call up the file and sling it to play on the wall. This footage was captured in atmosphere from the survey craft, and displays the hunt of a creature that, I presume, must have been killed off by the volatility of its environment between then and now. I don't think your people would have been able to settle your world if these things had still been present. The footage opens on a slender, arboreal mammalian with pink fur, climbing down from a lone tree in the light of dawn. That is a herbivore, coming down to gather fallen nuts. Keep watching, I assure them. A purple streak bursts from the indigo grass. The prosimian scarcely has time to react before a pair of jaws close around his neck and his body falls limp. His dizzying speed no longer required. The gracile feline predator stands eerily still for some moments, the carcass hanging from his mouth as it swivels its predatory head, scanning with its black, soulless eyes. The footage ends. You see? You live on a planet whose ecology is capable of creating monsters such as that. Even if there are none such as the moment, you surely see the risk. 
The pair look at me with expressions I haven't yet seen, both letting out juddering voiceless breaths. Should we show him Serobidi? asks the man. I think so, smiles the woman. What? What are you showing me? I ask, confused. The man reaches into a pocket on his suit and retrieves an alien-looking hollow pad. This is footage taken a year and a half ago in our home, he says, calling up a video. Will it work on your... He gestures to the wall. I gesture a go-ahead, and he flicks it to the wall, which has no problem replaying the alien file. What appears is precisely the same species of animal, slender and gracile, with his purple integument, feline face, and black eyes. Only this one, rather than standing on a savanna, is standing in the middle of what is clearly a living space, excitedly jumping from side to side, making ya ya vocalizations, while looking down on a human infant, around half the size of the prey animal, in the previous clip. The child shrieks at the animal in what must be a sound of terror. My stomachs drop as I imagine the horrific carnage that is about to be visited upon this sapient infant. Only it doesn't come. The creature doesn't attack the infant it could easily kill. The child jumps up and down, matched by the monster, and continues her nonsense vocalizations. Then the mother... The woman sitting before me passes through the back of the shot, her face turned towards the scene, but her body isn't, and her expression reads as... Mirth. Why are you showing me this? I demand, standing. Why didn't you try to help your infant? Come down, Captain, reassures the woman. It's all right. We didn't help Vahatra because she didn't need help. She and Sarabidi were playing. Limaka cheetahs are a popular pet on our planet, explains the man. At the same time, his wife reappears in frame and scoops up both the animal and her daughter with apparently delighted vocalizations emanating from all three. The infant shrieking, the woman laughing, the monster nyaaing, as it seems to try and fail to gnaw through the skin on the side of her face. There's my girls, comes the voice of the male ambassador from behind the camera. The viewing angle changes as he stands and approaches the free, entering the frame from the left and bending down to press his lips against the woman's, over the infant's head. The man ends the playback and I sit in stunned silence for a few moments. Uh, Captain, you alright? asks the woman hesitantly. Your death Walders, I mumble desolately. We're what? Smiles the man, confused. You are death Walders, I answer miserably. What the? I thought the planet had to be miscategorized if you'd settled it. Then I saw that it wasn't. I thought you must have settled it in ignorance of what it was, or because you had no other choice, but you clearly didn't. You settled that planet because you didn't see anything wrong with it at all. Because you come from somewhere just as bad, or worse. With this, there can be no doubt. I gestured to the still image of the woman, casually holding a vicious predator on the wall. The way you handle monstrous animals like playthings. The way you say you've tamed AI. The way you weren't killed when I fell on you. With a worried puff, the woman answers. We weren't killed because, while you're big, you're light, and the gravity is super low on your ship. That doesn't seem... I'm not light, though, I say frantically. I am a ball male Ulat. Ula is a class 8. I mass more than 100 kilograms. The gravity on this ship is 1.4 galactic standard for my species' comfort. Any other sapiens your size would have been killed by one as substantial as me falling on them the way I fell on you. You weren't even injured. You're death folders. That's the only explanation. Slow down, Captain, says the man, gesturing with a long-fingered hand. What are death folders, 
And why would it be such a problem if we were then? Life-bearing planets are categorized into a scale. Class 1 to Class 12 plus, based on the presence and severity of threats to sapient life on them. A deathfold is any planet above a Class 10, thought to be both incapable of producing sapients or allowing their settlement. There has never been a sapient deathfold species before. Until now, I sigh, gesturing miserably across the table to them. Okay, that does explain a lot about why it's taken us so long to realize we aren't alone in the universe, but what's the issue? asked the woman. The issue is that everyone is going to be terrified of you, I cry out frustratedly. They're going to think you're monsters. They're going to be looking for reasons to hate you. Every single unsavory or unscrupulous thing your species has ever done is going to be poured over until we find a casus belly. It will mean war for certain. The man gives a somber smile and asks, Are you terrified of us, Captain? Do you think we're monsters? Do you want war? No, I thump. But that's different. I'm an Ulat. My people are renowned for bravery, and I've met you. Then, shrugs the woman, we'll just have to come with you and meet everyone else. No, you can't, I say, panicking. I would be sentencing you to death if I were to bring you to Citadel. I won't do it. Okay, all right. We won't ask you to, then, sues the man. But if you can see we aren't monsters, surely others will, too. They can look at the information on there. He points to the drive on the table and see that we're people just like them. And you'll be there to tell them what we're like, won't you? I'm sure that cooler heads will prevail. 2714, Terran Calendar. One year after. No! I gasp as I awake. My left hand shooting into the air above the sturdy bed. In the room I moved into 12 days ago. It takes some moments before my breathing slows and my heart stops beating like drums. I place my large arms on the bed and use them to leverage up my enormous bulk. I walk to the mirror and see the face of a man with more than 20 trillion ghosts draped about his neck. Time to get dressed, I groan wearily. White for today.